Hello students, I am Gyan from English Magus and welcome to today's lesson, The Interview, by Christopher Sylvester Chapter 7 in CBSE Class 12 English Core Book Flamingo. The chapter has two parts. In part 1 the author explores the multifaceted world of interviews, delving into the perspectives of various famous personalities on this journalistic tool. We shall analyze the function, merits, and criticisms of interviews, enhancing our understanding of this essential yet controversial method of communication in modern media. In the second part we will read an actual interview of Umberto Eco. Let's begin the chapter by knowing a little about the author of the first part. Christopher Sylvester was a student of history at Peterhouse, Cambridge. He was a reporter for Private Eye for 10 years and has written features for Vanity Fair. Following is an excerpt taken from his introduction to the Penguin Book of Interviews, an anthology from 1859 to the present day. Before we delve into the detailed explanation, let's have a look at its theme. The primary theme of the interview is the complex nature of the interview as a journalistic practice. It highlights the varied opinions on its efficacy and morality, showcasing both its power to reveal truth and its potential to intrude and cause harm. The chapter reflects on how interviews shape public perception and the ethical considerations surrounding them. Now we shall begin the paragraph-wise explanation of the first part of the chapter. Before we do so, I recommend you to pause and read text on each slide before listening to its explanation. This approach will deepen your understanding as we go through our detailed analysis. Let us begin the explanation now. In the beginning lines of part 1 the author explains interviews, a staple of journalism for over 130 years, are familiar to almost everyone. Thousands of celebrities have been interviewed multiple times, leading to diverse opinions on the practice. Some regard interviews as an art form and a source of truth, while others see them as intrusive and unwelcome. This section sets the stage for the debate over the interview's value and impact. This section illustrates the negative perceptions some prominent figures have towards being interviewed. Some celebrities view interviews as invasive, likening them to soul-stealing in primitive cultures. V.S. Napol believes interviews harm individuals, while Lewis Carroll detested being interviewed, avoiding it to the point of pride in silencing interviewers. In these lines we come to know one more prominent figure's views on interviews. Rudyard Kipling vehemently opposed interviews, equating them to moral crimes and personal assaults. Despite this strong stance, Kipling had previously interviewed Mark Twain, showcasing the irony and complexity in his view. His wife's diary recounts a day ruined by reporters, emphasizing his disdain for the practice. In these lines the author tells us about some more celebrities who had negative views about interviews. H. G. Wells described interviews as ordeals but participated in them frequently even interviewing Joseph Stalin. Saul Billow likened interviews to having thumbprints on his windpipe, highlighting the discomfort they can cause. Despite their drawbacks, interviews are powerful communication tools, shaping our impressions of contemporaries and giving interviewers significant influence. The first part ends here. Here is a list of figures of speech used in this part. Pause the video and go through it. Now, we will discuss the second part. We shall delve into an authentic interview between Umberto Eco and Mukund Padmanabhan. Eco, a renowned scholar and professor at the University of Bologna in Italy, achieved immense success with his novel, selling over 10 million copies and solidifying his status as an intellectual superstar. In these lines Mukund asks Eco about his various achievements. Eco humorously remarked that he seems to do many things, but it's all rooted in his philosophical interests. He described using interstices or small gaps in time productively, like writing an article while waiting for someone. This unique approach highlights his ability to integrate his philosophical pursuits into various forms of writing. In these lines Mukund mentions Eco's non-fiction work is engaging and personal, contrasting with typical academic writing, which can be dry and impersonal. Eco explained this narrative style began with his doctoral dissertation, where he told the story of his research, including trials and errors. This approach was well received and became a hallmark of his scholarly writing, blending storytelling with academic rigor. In these lines we come to know Eco started his late start in novel writing, attributing it to a spontaneous decision. It started when he wrote his doctoral dissertation. He wrote it in narrative style. Unlike his friend Roland Burtz, who longed to write fiction, Eco felt no such frustration and began writing novels around age 50. His narrative approach in essays naturally extended to his fiction, satisfying his interest in storytelling. In this section we learn that despite his extensive academic work, Eco is often recognized primarily as a novelist. While this perception amuses him, 
he sees himself as a university professor who writes novels on Sundays. Eco participates in academic conferences rather than literary events, emphasizing his identification with the academic community. He acknowledges novels reach a larger audience, which academic texts on semiotics cannot. In these lines Eco discusses the unexpected success of The Name of the Rose, a novel intertwining detective fiction with deep themes like metaphysics and medieval history. He explains that journalists and publishers underestimate readers' appetite for challenging content. The novel's success demonstrates that readers sometimes seek intellectually stimulating material alongside simpler entertainment. In the ending lines reflecting on the novel's success, Eco shares an anecdote about his American publisher's initial low expectations, given the book's medieval setting and complex themes. However, it sold millions of copies in the US. Eco believes the success remains a mystery suggesting the novel's timing played a crucial role. This unpredictability highlights the enigmatic nature of literary success. With this the chapter concludes. Here is the list of literary devices used in this part. Pause the video and go through it and stay tuned for more entertaining explanations of our upcoming lessons. Thank you for joining us. Kindly like and subscribe if you found the lesson helpful. See you in the next lesson.